Uh, the title of today's talk is called The Cognitive Foundations of Spiritual Experiences uh, in Chinese uh, World of Warcraft. Uh, and um, I am research faculty at a school of psychology, but I'm actually an anthropologist, and most of my work, uh, I've done a lot of work with Chinese young adults who spend extensive amounts of time in video games. And um, what I want to talk about today is the role of video game in manifesting spiritual experiences, or what the Chinese players say are spiritual experiences. And I am going to at times read straight off of the teleprompter. Apologies in advance. Okay, what we got here? All right, and I'll get to the I'll get to the central research question here uh, in just a moment. But let me let me back up um, and give some background here. In the first half of this talk, I'm going to talk about spiritual experiences, Jingshan experiences. And uh, the Chinese World of Warcraft players claim to have, while they play the game, as a normal part of gameplay. Okay, they're not going in there uh, operationalizing uh, Buddhist ideologies or Christian ideologies. These seem to be spontaneous events. They report that they're spontaneous. They say, I'm playing, it just happens. And um, what do I mean by spiritual experiences? I'm going to cheat here a little bit um, and impose an interpretation on you. Okay, I have uh, argued elsewhere that most of these experiences meet criteria that the French sociologist uh, Emile Durkheim, who's this gentleman, uh, Victorian era gentleman up here on the right, has called collective effervescence. Okay, uh, in previous work I have connected to the, these experiences to collective effervescence, <laughs> and uh, I don't have much time here to establish this connection today, and the connection I don't think will be. Um, obvious from the quotes I'm going to uh, present. So I'm just going to ask you to humor me because it's my birthday and go with me on this, okay? And the only reason I bring this up here, uh, the only reason I'm, I'm even telling you about you know, work that exists somewhere out there is because I consider these, I consider what these players report they have to be a religious experience of sorts, okay? so. And um, you can beat me up about definitions about what is or isn't a religion later, but just for today, you know, next 30 minutes, if we, you just humor me on this, that would, that would be good. And um, so the big question is, how did we get here? Okay, how did we get here? What are some of the causal factors that resulted in the emergence of religious phenomena from a video game that has no religious con uh, content, no overt religious content, um, that is being played by players who 89% of them say are not themselves religious, okay? So if this is collective effervescence or something like that, how did this happen? Okay, what were the factors uh, leading up to this? And in previous work, I have identified a number of factors that correlate with players who claim to have these experiences. Okay, so uh, Chinese young adults, uh, mostly between 19 and 25, who claim both uh, a sense of moral certainty about their lives. They, they say, I have a strong moral identity, I know what I want, I know what good is, I know what bad is. And also players who report having extreme moral confusion, uh, what Durkheim would have called anime. Um, they say, well, there's so, China's changing so quickly, you know, my parents say this, my teachers say that, my friends say this, I don't even really know. People who report strong levels of moral confusion and people who report high levels of moral certainty uh, both correlate with these experiences. People who experience pressure to stop playing also correlate with these experiences. So some of these uh, young adults, their parents uh, tell them you shouldn't be playing that game. Um, they're sensitive to media, uh, uh, calling into question the moral worth of the game, suggesting that uh, the game is opium, electronic opium that's bad for people. And people who uh, endure what, or players who endure what Durkheim called fatalistic pressures, and that's kind of a, Bit of a strange word in, in today's parlance, but by fatalistic, he meant people who um, their daily lives are very restricted, okay, they can't move around a lot. So uh, in, in China today, this would be high school students, right? You're in class from like 8 a.m. till 9 p.m. You don't have a lot of opportunities to go out and play basketball or hang out with your friends. You're just kind of stuck. Uh, this is what Durkheim would have called a fatalistic pressure. And um, he thought this was. This made people have a strong need for moral expression because he believed that we had these strong intuitions for moral expression and that we needed to kind of exercise them. And sure enough, players who, are, who report being confined to a, a small radius of space on a daily basis also report these. 
But today's research is not about any of that. Today's research is about the game itself. And what role does the game itself play in manifesting these experiences? Why is the game good for these experiences? Um, how do game and mind interact in a way that generates these experiences? So, so these, these first factors, I mean, I believe are creating a need or a vacuum for these experiences. How does the game deliver? How does the game uh, provide those? So here's the central research question underlying uh, today's talk. Um, what formal properties of the game world, the Mojo Shijie game world, and which cognitive mechanisms are interacting to create engaged spiritual experiences? And finally, <clears throat> that's the central research question. Uh, so what? Why does any of this matter? What should we care about um, these uh, fancy interpretations of experiences uh, in video games? Um, well, I believe that altogether this research enables us to put together a model of the emergence of collective effervescence. So a lot of CSR theorizing is focused on origins of human religiosity. How did this start? You know, 20,000 years ago when we start seeing evidence of afterlife beliefs and, and, and these types of things, how did that start? As scientists, you know, we like to directly observe things, but um, we can't go back 20,000 years and figure out how this group of people started doing this activity that we describe today as collective effervescence. But when we see something like this just kind of emerge from largely secular materials, this game is only 10 years old. Um, if we can identify some of the causal factors that went into this, you know, we could make a model of emergence for how this got off the ground, and that could lead to testable hypotheses. You know, we could have a, I don't want to be facetious, but we could have a recipe for collective effervescence. And so today's talk is looking at what role does this game play uh, in that, in that uh, recipe. And so uh, with that extended preface, um, today's talk proceeds as follows. I'll just quickly introduce Mo Shou Shi Jie for those of you who uh, have no idea what it is. And just, I only have two examples of, of spiritual experiences uh, on the slides today. Uh, I'm going to connect these to moral foundations theory. Uh, there's two psychologists uh, named Joseph Hyde, uh, Jonathan Hyde, and Craig Joseph, who argue that all human minds have these cognitive mechanisms um, dedicated to certain types of moral cognition. I'm going to argue that certain aspects of the game world are activating these mechanisms, and that the outputs from these mechanisms are informing or, or a part of uh, these spiritual experiences. And then I'm going. I've broken this down into two hypotheses to test this, and I'm going to present survey data from 545 uh, Chinese World of Warcraft players that is pretty supportive, not, not 100%. Oops. Okay, so uh, World of Warcraft, uh, it's an online video game designed by a company called Blizzard, and they're in California, and um, I guess, sorry, I don't know why those colors aren't manifestly. Um, it's a difficult game to summarize in just a few minutes. It's very complex. Uh, try to boil it down to a few uh, gameplay imperatives. The big thing is to team up with your friends and go do uh, raid dungeons. And, and you, you get together in these groups of five or 10 or 25 and you have to uh, run through all these dungeons killing dragons and, and everyone has to contribute. Everyone has a role. And um, that's kind of the marquee gameplay. Uh, for this, for uh, or should yet. Um, when you enter the game, you have to pick one of two sides. You can either be Alliance on the left or Horde, and you're a member of one of these factions, and you have to run around kind of trying to kill members of the other faction. All right, and when you, when you um, achieve the game's marquee end game objectives, you can get this wonderfully ostentatious, huge, epic gear, swords and helmets and, and horses, and you know, this might take six months to get, okay? So uh, these actually have real powerful social values in the game. If you're walking around with this short sword, and this sword is called Blessed Thunder Fury, Blessed Something of the Windseeker. And it was extremely hard to get. And uh, so this guy will walk around with this and just, you know, he'll, everyone will say, wow, that's really great. And so this is another appeal of gameplay, is getting this epic stuff. And uh, just exploring. So I have been kind of casually playing this game since 2007. Now because I'm an academic, I really don't have that much time. Uh, so I've only seen about 70% of the game world. Uh, but it is absolutely massive. And a lot of people really enjoy just walking around and exploring. It is a beautiful place. 
Um, and then just hanging out. People just go in to hang out with their friends. For a while, back around 2009, 2010, there was a trend of real world couples getting married in the game. And this is a wedding, okay? If, unless that wasn't obvious. Uh, someone here has, has gotten married. But there's all sorts of things you can do in this game. I had a, uh, a housemate when I was a student at Oxford. Uh, she was a Norwegian girl. And she went into World of Warcraft every single night to pick flowers and fish. And uh, so the game has many offerings. It, it's, it's a big complicated world, there's a lot to do. But this is just kind of a very basic introduction. And so for my, um, for my PhD field work, I spent about 15 months in Wuhan and uh, kind of living with these players who were spending 40, 50 hours a week uh, in the game. And I was trying to develop causal perspectives on gameplay, uh, just as a lot of the research today is focused on kind of explaining religion. I was trying to explain play. How does the game and mind interact in a way that just kind of grabs our minds and makes us so interested in this game? What's going on? How does it do that? And, um, and I was also interested in how the experiences they had in the game, how they were contextualizing them within their offline lives uh, in contemporary urban China. And anyway, by today, I've interviewed, surveyed, or collected testimonials from a couple thousand players. And um, Dr. Bond just said, in, in my beginning is my end. And I agree with that in most circumstances. But I kind of set out um, to study this game with highly influenced by Western media describing the effects of video games on aggression. And I was expecting these games to um, I was expecting these games to, I was expecting to see people who spent long amounts of time in these games to show elevated levels of a sense of personal agency, of control, of behaviors that we associate with kind of um, anger and that type of thing. And so I was very struck from the beginning by um, the large number of players that claim to have deep spiritual experiences when they play the game, and they attribute deep moral significance uh, to gameplay. So here's a testimonial uh, from a player that's kind of typical of uh, these responses. Here we go. Uh, wow has given me a spiritual feast. I haven't had teamwork for a long time. It is so much more than the teamwork allowed in very limited circumstances. Uh, wow emphasizes unconditional loyalty and friendship. Wow to me is a long spiritual odyssey. I, have to, I just have to keep walking. I should keep walking. And um, these discussions of in-game spirituality, um, they often featured a description of merger with the game world. So they talked about their soul going into the game, or they talked about being one with the game, or they talked about a sense of dissolved boundaries between themselves and the game. Okay, but by far, um, by far the most reliable common denominator across all the spiritual uh, experiences is a deep sense of moral significance attributed to gameplay. Um, these are always deeply moral experiences of, of compassion or a feeling of justice or just a feeling of satisfaction of becoming a better person. Okay. Um, the game is a very powerful source of these emotions, much more powerful uh, than real life or reality, as players call it. You can get a lot of spiritual encouragement in WoW, but you could never get in reality. This might be the essence of the game. While players have the spirit of teamwork, modesty, and harmonious communication that only exist in movies and cannot be found uh, in real society. Okay, so uh, what are these? What are these spiritual experiences? And they're not homogenous. They, they report kind of different types. But um, moral emotions and feelings are not comprehensive of these in-game spiritual experiences. But they are a very stable feature of them. They occur in all of them. Uh, so, to explain why the game was such a strong facilitator for spiritual experiences, I thought a good place to start would be to explain how is it a strong facilitator of, of moral experiences? How, why is it so good at eliciting compassion, a sense of justice, a sense of uh, a positive leadership, and these types of things? Okay. And uh, one possible reason that I've become pretty attached to is the idea that this game has is packed with stimuli that have a high competence in activating 
these uh, cognitive mechanisms dedicated to moral cognition. Okay, so there are two psychologists, uh, Jonathan Haidt and Craig Joseph. Um, some of you might have heard of them. They have something called moral foundations theory, and they argue that all human minds possess five cognitive mechanisms, uh, one each dedicated to uh, caring, uh, dedicated to assessing uh, what is a fair exchange, what's fair, what's not fair, tit for tat type reasoning, uh, the value of group loyalty, uh, how to detect and respond to authority. You know, we have um, all primates seem to have this system. They, they, they know who's in charge, they know how they should react, and they know when they're in charge, and they know how they can uh, act towards others. And uh, a system that uh, Justin discussed uh, earlier, uh, purity, uh, the need to keep some things free of contaminants, the need to keep some things separate from other things. And I'm just going to give an example of one of these um, that figure, uh, factors into the survey. <clears throat> Let me just talk a little bit about this CARE Foundation. So Haidt and Joseph argue that we have these because these cognitive mechanisms would have solved um, evolutionarily recurrent problems that we faced in our ancestral past, okay? Uh, <laughs> I forgot about that slide. Um, one of them is mammals, you know, we're mammals, and um, our babies, all mammalian babies, are, you know, very helpless. They need a lot of help, they need a lot of care. Uh, if they're going to survive, if they're going to live, to be old enough to reproduce, and our genes, you know, will be expressed in succeeding uh, generations. So, Parents have to have mechanisms, they have to have some sort of mental system that's capable of detecting suffering in children, uh, noticing when they're crying or they're in pain or they're upset, and then this, it needs to be able to detect vulnerability, and then it has to respond in ways that help us to help the child. So we get a feeling, this care system, um, it can be activated by a number of different things. Uh, Haidt and Joseph discuss a care system. One thing that's activated, um, is like screaming. So infant cries share the same basic acoustic structure as all mammalian cries, or at least most of them. And um, it, when, when we hear crying, there's a tendency, our prolactin levels, uh, I don't think these words are going to translate, uh, we have certain hormones that increase that kind of make us feel uh, a sense of compassion and, oh, you know, I want to I wanna help, I want to help this, this, this poor child. Um, there's a lot of work on baby schema, and so these are um, like big eyes relative to nose and mouth, and then there's been a lot of research showing that these activate like kind of reward systems in um, the mind that approach related re re reward systems. When we see these cute things, and they don't just have to be, you know, babies, right? Other animals kind of use these as well, and we see them and we think, oh, that's, you know, I, want, I want some of that. And um, um, digital media, so, they, these would have evolved to um, these would have evolved for babies, but they can be activated by other things. They can be activated by dogs, but digital media can just really exaggerate these inputs, right? And so we get you know things like uh, this cat, and it works. I mean, we see the cat, and we think you know, oh, but look how big his look how um, how much he exaggerates you know these same features, right? He's got these big, huge eyes, and that's his big power when he gets in trouble. If anyone has seen this movie, he just gets in as big as he possibly can. <laughs> and so we respond to this. We also respond to things like blood, okay? Whenever we see body contortions, bleeding, indicators that someone is vulnerable or in trouble, uh, we have a mechanism that knows that's important, you know, that you've got red stuff coming out of you. Maybe you need some help, okay? All right, okay, let me just, okay. So I have, I had this idea that one reason this game, one reason Moisha Shijia might be so good at creating um, moral experience, like positive moral emotions, is just to stick with this example, just to stick with the CARE Foundation, it is packed with the stuff that should activate these systems, okay? So in this game, um, everyone is dying, everyone is sick, everyone's bleeding, okay? There are lots of people who need help, and when we in this conference, when we leave here tonight, are any of us going to see any of that? I mean, you know, well, we hope not, but then again, I would, I would feel really excited if, if I got to rescue some damsel in distress, 
you know, or, or I had a good Samaritan moment, but it never happens. There's never anyone lying on the road, and I, you know, could give you a hand. But in this game, it's just nonstop. It's just a nonstop parade of vulnerability, okay? So, I'm not, let's see if I can fight you. Um, it's just fear of supernatural punishment. Um, okay. So I have this fancy theory, and um, but is that is that what's is that what's happening? Uh, does, is this game activating these systems described by Hyde and Joseph? So how to test this? Um, I started going through the game looking for uh, stimuli that might predict uh, the activation of these moral systems. Okay, and uh, I decided on class role. I'll tell you what that is. I decided on class role as a possible predictor. So. When you play this game, you have one of three roles to choose from, okay? You can be the healer, and if you're the healer, your job, uh, you're with your team, and it might be four other people, or it might be 39 other people, and your job is to you know, keep an eye on everyone, and when you see someone in trouble, they're bleeding or, or, or wheezing or compromised somehow, you have to cast spells on them that heal them and bring them back to health, right? Um, this little guy over here, who doesn't have a description because he doesn't factor into the survey, he's what we call a DPS, he's damage per second. And his job is just to deal out as much pain as fast as he can, okay? And, and um, you're right. <laughs> and, and, and finally, you have someone called the tank, okay? And he wears all these big armors. He's got a huge helmet and big shoulder pads and, and shields or something. And he runs in the front. So when we enter this, uh, this dungeon, he'll be in the front. And he has all these different abilities to try to make everyone attack him to save the rest of the group. Because this little healer up here, she can only wear like clothes like I have, these little, these little you know, soft cotton clothes. And if you hit her uh, or him, they're in a lot of trouble. But the tank wears a lot of armor, so he has to go first and try to convince all the enemies to, to hit him. Okay? So, but these are the roles. And we hypothesize that if you're a healer, you're kind of plugged into a different frequency when you play this game. You're looking for these stimuli that should activate the care foundation. Okay? You're looking for people who are suffering. You're looking for people who are vulnerable. Uh, vulnerable. So, okay. so we hypothesize that healers should experience greater frequency of care foundation activation than non-healers. If, if this game is activating these systems, you know, this is one way of, of kind of putting that to the test. And one of the ways we uh, measured this was in this survey, we asked players when they played, how often did they feel these uh, appraisal feeling uh, dyads. How often do you feel a sense of warmth and caring for other players? How often do you feel, I want to help this person, okay? And we hypothesize that tanks should experience greater frequency of authority uh, activation than non-tanks. And I don't uh, have time to go into uh, all the rationale behind this, but I'm happy to talk about it later. And um, so we asked them, we asked players also, um, when you're playing this game, how often do you feel like a quality leader? How often do you feel I demonstrate good leadership uh, in this game? And so we just did an online survey. We had 545 participants. No surprise that 504 were males, uh, 41 were females, and um, median age was 24. Okay, so the tanks killed it. Uh, the tanks scored uh, two. So. Uh, when we ask these questions, how often do you feel, you know, compassion, how often do you feel these things, uh, they, uh, they had a four-point Likert scale. One was, you know, uh, never, four was uh, all the time, or very frequently. Tanks did experience, um, tanks did experience uh, the authority feelings much more often than non-tanks, 2.31 versus 2.0. Uh, a one uh, a one tail t test revealed this to be significant at p equals zero point uh, zero one two, and the care it's in blue even though it's not significant, but it's not not significant. The, he'll fight me on that, but I, I don't care. Um, healers did score higher than non healers, uh, but it only approached significance at uh, p equals point uh, zero eight. Okay, so. Uh, <sighs> The hypotheses were kind of borne out. Um, the authority was, you know, 
we, we got the authority response we expected. Um, we didn't quite get the care response we expected. We did find an interaction with healers between uh, gender and the healer role. Okay. So um, female healers, this is women who play the game, who play the role, uh, who, who are healers, score way higher on care scores than male healers. They score way higher than female non-healers, so female tanks, female DPS, and all other non-healers, all uh, uh, P less than 0 .001. And um, yeah, that's. I don't really know how to. In, there's a lot of different ways you could interpret that. Uh, but for the sake of today, I'll just say that um, I think these results demonstrate that these hypotheses are promising. Definitely wanting some nuance. There's clearly uh, plenty of uh, stuff going on here that they're not picking up. But I do think they kind of give preliminary validation to Jonathan Haidt and Craig Joseph's work for investigating why it is this game, um, why it is this game seems to be so good at creating these uh, deep moral experiences. And um, what role is this playing collective effervescence? Well, if you have children or young adults who have a strong sense of moral certitude in their lives or a strong sense of moral confusion, um, you can imagine that to have a place where they can go and just kind of really exercise those feelings of, of, uh, of, of, of profound moral experience, you know, this, this is just very appealing to them. I also have other reasons why the, the, um, the fatalistic pressures and, uh, um, what's the other one? The pressure to stop playing the game seem to motivate players to cultivate these experiences, but uh, slowly putting together kind of little causal models that I feel identifies uh, some underlying factors uh, responsible for the emergence of these experiences. And the role of the game in this is it is full of these stimuli that have a strong capacity to activate uh, moral cognition. So um, that's my talk. Uh, there's so many people to thank. Um, of course, uh, thanks very much to Templeton World Char Charity Foundation. Uh, thanks so much to all you guys for coming, not just to this uh, talk, but um, you know, I've seen uh, most of you um, at your own universities. And uh, I'm sure Justin will thank her as well. But I also just want to thank uh, Rebecca uh, standing in the back for organizing everything. Um, she's more than anyone else responsible uh, for this conference happening. So uh, I'm just going to pass it over to Justin, who's going to wrap it up here. Oh, sorry. No, uh, yeah, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to.